Today we are continuing our investigation of Bank of America's acquisition of Merrill Lynch. When we held our first hearing on this merger, I called it a shotgun wedding. Now it looks like a marriage of convenience. Ken Lewis got what he wanted, and the Treasury and the Feds got what they wanted. All of this happened against a backdrop of unchecked government power. With no transparency or accountability, Ken Lewis appears to have manipulated the accountable system to his benefit. He started this bailout in motion when he made the first phone call to Mr. Paulson. They got the government involved. He got the Treasury to cough up $20 billion of taxpayers' money to help finance his merger. He never had to disclose $12 billion in Merrill Lynch losses to investors until it was over. He never had to ask the shareholders to reconsider the transaction. In the end, Mr. Lewis got everything he wanted. Mr. Parson and Mr. Bernanke also got what they wanted out of this marriage. They got an uninterrupted merger that they believe helped to stabilize the market. The problem is that while all of this was going on, the American people, investors, and the Congress were kept in the dark. There was no oversight to determine whether this arrangement made sense. In my view, this is unacceptable and must be prevented from happening in the future. That being said, significant issues need to be resolved today. Was Bank of America really forced to go through with the deal? Or was this just an old-fashioned Brooklyn shakedown? Did Ken Lewis threaten to back out of the deal in order to squeeze more money out of the federal government? If Mr. Parson believed that Ken Lewis had demonstrated a colossal lack of judgment, why did he and Mr. Bernanke leave Lewis in charge of Bank of America? Did government officials tell Ken Lewis to keep quiet about the escalating losses at Merrill Lynch and the government's commitment to provide billions in federal funding? Did Congress make a mistake in conferring broad authority on the Fed and Treasury in October 2008 when the TARP Fund program was created. Should Congress have required more accountability, transparency, and checks and balances in the operation of the TARP funds? Perhaps Mr. Paulson will help, help us shed some further light on this transaction and help us to answer these questions. I look forward to his testimony this morning. I now yield five minutes to our ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Darrell Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being a full partner in this process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, and the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Garrett, be allowed to sit in on the panel pursuant to our rules and ask questions at the end of all other questioners. I think we're just going in. I think, we, yeah, I think it's yeah, 10 o'clock. We're just yeah, going in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, after reading uh, former Secretary Paulson's testimony, it's clear that most of the basic facts related to this event in December of last year are no longer in question. Secretary Paulson has confirmed that he did tell Bank of America CEO Ken Lewis that if the Bank of America exercised the MAC clause and later needed assistance, then ma management would or could, depending on how you look at it, be fired. This is not in debate. As a matter of fact, the candor and, and clarity that the Secretary is bringing to us today is refreshing and helpful. The fact that the Secretary does not believe it is inappropriate 
perhaps we should look at in light of the times. Just as revisionists have rewritten what we were doing after 2001 to protect the homeland, we are already beginning to question whether, in fact, means used at the disposal of the Fed and the Treasury and the FDIC were inappropriate or appropriate now that, of course, a, financial, a global financial meltdown has been averted. I think in fairness, just like in the Cold War, had the Soviets come over the Czech border, we would have had to come as we are and bring what we had. What we had at the beginning of this crisis was, in fact, a Secretary of the Treasury, relatively new on the job, a Fed chairman, relatively new on the job, all of whom were being told, here's what's happening on a daily basis, do something about it. They came to us with a plan, a plan that I voted against, a plan to buy toxic assets for some $700 billion. But when they went back and started looking at how to execute after receiving it, it became clear that it was more complex, that it was more nuanced, that the needs were not necessarily for toxic asset purchases, and that it might not be in the taxpayer's best interest. So although there will be some things that I approve of and some that I disapprove of, I think today, Mr. Chairman, we have to consider with this last witness the situation that existed at that time, one in which the President had lobbied heavily for monies, but without anyone having a book written on how you get through these times. Wall Street perhaps would say that the end justifies the means. We have, in fact, been saved. Here in Washington, we're Monday morning quarterbacks. Monday morning quarterbacks say, in fact, if we have to play again next Sunday, how do we do better? What can we learn from what happened on the gridiron on Sunday? Mr. Chairman, that's our job here today. We have to ask some serious questions and use an expert witness as part of the process. We have to ask, what would he do differently if he had it to do over again? He may or may not be able to answer it. What should we do in order to glean the causes, the events, the solutions, and in fact, what regulatory changes will be necessary or at least considered if we are to be prepared to either not have it happen again or, as the chairman said, provide the transparency, accountability, predictability, and rule of law the next time that may have been lacking in this once-in-a-century event. So, Mr. Chairman, on a bipartisan basis, I am thrilled that we are bringing to a close this three-part hearing process because I believe it is helpful and will continue to be helpful, not just as oversight, but as a partner in the necessary reform. And, Mr. Chairman, I might take note that just yesterday, all of the, on the House side at least, all of the commissioners for the 9-11 style financial commission that you and I worked on together were named. That's a beginning of what could be up to an 18-month process in which I believe that both of us and all the members of our committee will be working together to ensure that, we, that our reforms fit future possible challenges. I thank the Chairman and yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Issa from uh, California. Uh, this hearing is being conducted jointly with the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. I now yield five minutes for opening statement to the chairman of that subcommittee, Congressman Kucinich from Ohio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I don't think the question uh, facing us today, with all due respect to my friend from California, is uh, whether or not uh, this is a moment for Monday morning quarterbacks. Uh, the question is whether taxpayers should have uh, purchased the Bank of America franchise. Now, with Mr. Paulson's testimony today, it's, un it's an undisputed fact that then-Secretary Paulson told Bank of America's Ken Lewis that the government might remove him and his board of directors if Bank of America abandoned its deal to acquire Merrill Lynch. It requires a judgment call to decide if Secretary Paulson was being justifiably tough in response to Bank of America's consideration of invoking the material adverse change clause in its merger contract, an arguably unwise but lawful action, which he viewed as a potential threat to the financial system at a moment of crisis. But nothing in Secretary Paulson's testimony today justifies the government's decision to ignore evidence 
that Bank of America withheld information from its shareholders about mounting losses at Merrill Lynch before the crucial shareholder vote on December 5th, a potentially illegal act. I've seen no justification for the government to override recommendations of professional staff at the Fed and the president of a regional Federal Reserve Bank for greater accountability of Bank of America's top executives. Yet, sadly, that is precisely what Mr. Paulson and Mr. Bernanke did. This committee's investigation and two previous hearings have revealed that the government had concluded that Mr. Lewis's management of Bank of America was seriously deficient and possibly in legal jeopardy. Top staff at the Fed and Treasury had determined that Mr. Lewis knew about accelerating losses at Merrill Lynch before the shareholder vote to ratify the merger, but he did not provide that information to shareholders. The top lawyer at the Fed had determined that Mr. Lewis and his management team were possibly in violation of securities laws for withholding material information from shareholders. Top professional staff at the Fed had determined that Mr. Lewis and his management team had failed to do due diligence in acquiring Merrill Lynch and were not up to the task of identifying and solving the problems in which they found themselves in late 2008. Top staff at the Fed and even the president of a regional Federal Reserve Bank were pressing for a number of new requirements on Bank of America as conditions of any federal bailout in order to remedy the deficient management they perceived. If you look at the screen, appreciate if staff would put that up, you will see the supporting documents our investigation has revealed. In an email from a senior advisor at the Federal Reserve to Chairman Bernanke, quote, there are clear signs in the data we have that the deterioration at Merrill Lynch has been observably underway over the entire quarter, albeit picking up significantly around mid-November, unquote. Next slide, please. From a restricted Federal Reserve analysis of Bank of America Merrill Lynch merger, quote, BAC management's contention that the severity of MER's uh, losses only came to light is problematic and implies substantial deficiency in the diligence carried out in advance of and subsequent to the acquisition. These were clearly shown in Merrill Lynch's internal risk management reports that BAC reviewed during their due diligence. Next slide, please. The potential for losses and other risk exposures cited by management, including those coming from leveraged loans and the trading in complex structured credit derivatives. Uh, that's pro derivatives products, that's called correlation trading, should also have been reasonably well understood, particularly at BAC itself, is also active in both these products. Next slide, please. From an email from the Fed's general counsel to Chairman Bernanke, Lewis should have been aware of the problems at uh, ML, uh, Merrill Lynch, earlier, because as early as mid-November, uh, and not caught by surprise, that could cause other problems for him around the disclosures uh, Bank of America made for the shareholder vote, unquote. Next slide, please. From another email from the Fed's general counsel to Chairman Bernanke. A different question, quote, a different question that doesn't seem to be the one Lewis is, is focused on is related to disclosure. Management may be exposed if it doesn't properly disclose information that is material to investors. His potential liability here will be whether he knew or reasonably should have known the magnitude of the Merrill Lynch losses when Bank of America made its disclosures to get the shareholder vote on the Merrill Lynch deal in early November. Unquote. Next slide, please. An early, excuse me, in early December. To get the shareholder vote on the Merrill Lynch deal in early December. Unquote. Next slide, please. From talking points prepared by top staff at the Federal Reserve. Quote, Bank of America should expect to be required to more intrusive review and involvement by the U.S. government in the selection of management of Bank of America, including the Board of Directors, unquote. And the final slide. From an email from Eric Rosengren, President of the Boston Federal Reserve Bank, to Chairman Bernanke, quote, going forward, I'm concerned if we too quickly move to a ring fence uh, strategy, particularly if we believe that existing management is a significant source of the problem and that they do not have a good grasp of the extent of their problems and appropriate strategies to resolve them. I think it's instructive to look at the example of the Royal Bank of Scotland, the UK replaced senior management. I would not want to discard this option prematurely, unquote. In spite of the evidence and recommendations from top staff, 
Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke bailed out the merger of Bank of America and Merrill Lynch without requiring replacement of Bank of America's top management or board of directors or imposing any meaningful new requirements on Bank of America's management. Not every national government faced with troubled, systematically significant banks behaved the same way. The UK dismissed top corporate management at Royal Bank of Scotland upon rescuing the company without impairing the bank's ability to operate. Even in the US, General Motors' top executive was pushed aside as a condition of federal support. But in the United States, the management of systemically significant banks such as Bank of America not only kept their jobs, they received billions in taxpayer dollars to help plug the holes in their balance sheets. Secretary Paulson regards the government's intervention in financial markets as successful. Certainly TARP and the Fed's many new lending facilities aid systematically significant banks and have bought time for those banks. But the lasting contribution... The gentleman summarize. I'll summarize right now. The lasting contribution of this committee's investigation will be exposing Treasury and the Fed's failure to require meaningful accountability from systemically significant banks in exchange for federal bailout. Not a single CEO of a systemically significant bank was removed from his job by government action for a a misdeed or mistake, nor has a single CEO of a systemically significant bank fully explained his role in creating the circumstance of the financial crisis. The biggest, most powerful bankers have essentially received a free ride at taxpayers' expense. In conclusion, in choosing to bail out Bank of America without also removing its top management for their failure to do due diligence and for withholding potentially material information from shareholders prior to the merger ratification vote, the government sent a signal to the management of all systemically significant banks that their mistakes and their misdeeds will be treated differently and more gently by regulators than those committed by managers of mid-sized and small-sized banks. Over the coming months and years, it will prove to be a dangerously destabilizing signal that we will deeply regret. I yield back. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as a point of order, we, on this side at least, we have not received any of the documents that were displayed. Could we get copies of each of those that were put on the board, please? We'd be delighted to do so. Without objection. I now yield um, to the gentleman from Ohio again, who is a r- policy, of course, r- the ranking member of domestic policy subcommittee, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank you, Chairman Kucinich, ranking member ISA, uh, for working with me and others uh, to get this series of hearings uh, here in front of the committee. I would also like to thank Secretary Paulson for coming before the committee today, and I look forward to. Uh, I think we all look forward to his uh, testimony and, and the few hours we get to spend here uh, with him. The fall of 2008 was a watershed time for our economy. Our, econ- our economic challenges were felt the most by the millions of Americans who lost jobs, saw savings shrink, and their credit tighten. Unfortunately, the approach taken by the federal government, I believe, is dangerous, and I think many Americans would argue has not helped. Federal bailouts and federal stimulus packages are transforming our free market economy into a political economy. The federal government now selects the winners and the losers. The current issue before this committee is merely a symptom of the ever-increasing reach of the federal government into the everyday affairs of American businesses and American families. Should anyone be surprised by the way the federal government has administered the bailout program? With the trillion dollars at their disposal, little guidance and oversight, we have seen Treasury and the Federal Reserve behave in a way that can only be described as unprecedented. The evidence is clear. The federal government has used threats, intimidation, and I believe deception to impose growing command and control over our economy. With the increasing nationalization of everything from banks to car companies, runaway federal spending and deficits, higher taxes, government takeovers of energy, and potentially health care, all while the economy is deteriorating even further and more American jobs are being lost. The American people are saying enough is enough, and the American people want answers. I look uh, look forward to hearing from Mr. Paulson about his role in these dealings and would yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. uh for your statement. Um, we turn now to our witness, um, Henry M. Paulson. Mr. Paulson served as the Secretary of the Treasury from 2006 to 2009, January 2009. He previously served as the Chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs. It is committee policy, Mr. Paulson, that we swear our witnesses in. Will you please stand and raise your right hand? Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I if do. so, let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. So, Mr. Parson, you may begin. Okay. 
uh, Chairman Towns, uh, Ranking Member Issa, and distinguished members of the committee. I served as Secretary of the Treasury from July 2006 to January 2009. During my tenure, the world experienced a financial crisis unprecedented in our lifetimes. The crisis presented a relentless series of novel challenges that required swift, innovative, and dramatic responses. Had the crisis of 2008 been left to unfold without strong federal reaction and intervention, the world of 2009 would look very different from the world we live in today. Many more Americans would be without their homes, their jobs, their businesses, their savings, their way of lives. The crisis of confidence last fall threatened to disrupt our entire financial system, not just the institutions that had high credit losses on their mortgage investments, but all financial firms, whether weak or solvent. As liquidity dried up, the continued collapse of financial institutions that provide credit and handle payments would have meant in short order that firms across industries, not just Wall Street, but every street, would have seen a massive curtailment of access to financing needed to purchase supplies and pay employees. Missed payrolls would have quickly turned into even more millions of layoffs, and this in turn would have meant an even greater retreat of consumer spending. It would have been extremely difficult to break the momentum of this downward spiral. Now that the financial system is stabilized, we can and should take the time to learn the lessons of the past. In the midst of a rapidly changing crisis, our responses were not perfect, but I am confident that they were substantially correct and that they saved this nation from great peril. This hearing is about Bank of America, and in my prepared testimony, I lay out the series of events surrounding its acquisitions acquisition of Merrill Lynch. There are three issues that are appropriate to address at the outset of this hearing. First, some have opined that I and other government officials allowed concerns about systemic risk to outweigh concerns about potential harm to Bank of America and its shareholders. That simply did not happen. In my view and the view of numerous government officials working on the matter, the interests of the nation and Bank of America were aligned with respect to the closing of the Merrill Lynch transaction. Second, some have suggested that there was something inappropriate about my conversation of December 21st with Mr. Lewis, in which I mentioned the possibility that the Federal Reserve could remove management and the board of Bank of America if the bank invoked the MAC clause. I believe it was appropriate for me to explain to Mr. Lewis that the government was supportive of Bank of America and that it felt very strongly that if Bank of America exercised the MAC clause, that would show a colossal lack of judgment and would jeopardize Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and the financial system. It was also appropriate for me to remind him that under such circumstances, the Federal Reserve could invoke its authority to remove management and the board of Bank of America. I intended my message to reinforce the strong view that had been expressed by the Fed and which was shared by the Treasury that it would be unthinkable that Bank of America take this destructive action. Third, the, destruction, the, the suggestion has been made that I discourage Mr. Lewis from making required disclosures to the public markets about losses at Merrill Lynch. That simply did not happen and Mr. Lewis has denied it unambiguously in testimony before this committee. I would like to conclude with what is most prominent in my recollection of the events of last fall. What I recall most vividly is a nation faced with a threat of an unparalleled economic crisis and the efforts of the men and women from both the public and private sectors who worked hard to steer our nation away from that precipice. It was my privilege to work with them, and I am proud of what we have accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Paulson. Now, we will begin with the um, question period. Each memo in turn will have five minutes, of course, and I will um, uh, begin 
as you can see, uh, put the document up uh, on the screen, Mr. Mr. Lewis of Bank of America claimed under oath to Attorney General Cuomo's office that he would have renegotiated the deal if you didn't tell him he could not do so. A lawyer says to Mr. Lewis, you can always renegotiate. Mr. Lewis says, not when you're told you cannot do it. Mr. Lewis is asked, would you have tried to rene renegotiate the price if you weren't told not to do it by Mr. Paulson? Mr. Lewis's answer to that is yes. Is it true then, Mr. Paulson, that you told Mr. Lewis he could not renegotiate the Merrill deal? Well, wasn't uh, quite that direct or specific, but I can be very clear that we viewed the invocation of a MAC clause, whether it was to, uh, whether it was to, to renegotiate or just get out of the merger as being very risky. The, uh, the markets were driven by fear and uncertainty, and an invocation of a MAC clause uh, whether it was ultimately going to be resolved by the courts or be resolved by a renegotiation and a shareholder vote would lead to an extended uh, uh, and difficult process. And the fact still remained that the, uh, we viewed the MAC clause as being a legally binding contract. Was that a yes? Well, that was, that was what I said. I said that, that we viewed, I, I viewed, and I, 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 I know the Fed viewed, that the invocation of a MAC uh, clause uh, was w w would be a, a serious mistake. It would be a colossal lack of judgment if he invoked the MAC clause, whether it was to renegotiate or whether it was to, to go through a, uh, the, the, the courts. Yeah, I'm still trying to find out whether that was a yes or no. Well, the, and maybe the, it's not allowed. The, the, did I order him directly? I, it wasn't it wasn't that direct, but I, I did say that I thought a invoking the MAC clause would be a would be a colossal lack of judgment. There was no uh, sound legal basis for it, and the distinction between invoking the MAC clause to renegotiate or go to the courts was what was one for, that, for all practical purposes, was not a significant one. Well, let me say if. Uh he had issued an indicated fact that the MAC clause, that he would, wouldn't that be a colossal lack of judgment on his part? And would this, wouldn't this have jeopardized his own bank and the American economy if he exercised the MAC? Yes. Y yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the, it was a view of, of very experienced uh, Federal Reserve lawyers that there wasn't no, uh, there wasn't a sound legal basis, and it is my understanding that there is no instance where a Delaware court has let a company use a MAC clause to get out of a merger, and this particular MAC clause he even had a carve out which 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 carved out changes due to market conditions. My concern is that if you had if you had those concerns, you know. Um why didn't you just fire him? Well, I would, I would say this. Remember, Mr. M Mr. Lewis did not invoke the MAC clause. He did not do something that caused a colossal, uh, that, that showed a colossal lack of judgment. Uh, he, Mr. Lewis was considering this, and his board was considering this, and they decided, they decided to fulfill their contract and acquire M Merrill Lynch. Well, you know, it seemed to me that um, if he has this lack of judgment, I mean, how could you give him $20 billion? It seemed to me you would have just forced his hand at that point in time and, uh, and pushed him out. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm making a distinction between an action that he might have taken, which he didn't take. If he had taken an action that showed a lack of judgment, I think then the... Uh, uh, the regulator would have been irresponsible if the regulator didn't push him out. But he did not take that action, and uh, he, uh, they fulfilled their contract and they acquired Merrill Lynch. Let me, I'm running out of time here. Did you call Mr. Lewis or did he call you? 
in uh, reference to this government, this deal. In, in which, which of these calls? I'm you, is, is it true that Mr. Lewis called you in December 2008 and asked the government to get involved in the Merrill Lynch deal, he, or did you call him? No, he, uh, the, the first time we heard of this was, uh, was, was a call from Lewis. And so on December 17th, I heard from a member of my staff that he would be calling, and then I got a call from him, and he said that that uh, that, that he and his board were uh, were concerned to learn of the extent of Merrill uh, losses, which had uh, he'd become aware of very recently. Yeah. Well, I mean, my time has expired, but let me just ask you this before we run to the. Um, uh, is it true that Bank of America first brought up the bail, bailout? Did they bring up the bailout to you, or did you bring up the bailout to them? Well, Bank of America came to us with their concerns about their losses and, the, the, and their concerns about going ahead with the acquisition. And in terms of the, in terms of the bailout, I'm not, I, I, I prefer to use the word rescue, but but whatever word we use, that this came out of discussions because we had a very much, at least I, I think we had an, an alignment of interest because the, my, my concern was the American people. And I, I t took a look at the losses that I heard coming as you being You pull the mic just a little closer to you. Pull the and, mic a little closer to you. Pull the mic a little closer to you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So... So, as as I said, the um, the the rescue came out of discussions, and I view believe it was the view of the government, the the Fed and Treasury, that that when these announces were lost were announced, that they would truly shake the market were it not for a, a some form of government support being in place. And so we felt that we needed that in place in order to keep the, uh, the, the system intact. Yeah. Well, let me just say, uh, we'll, we'll continue to, um, uh, uh, on the second round, uh, I yield to the uh, Congressman from California, Ranking Member, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Paulson, you know, in, with our previous uh, two testimony uh, witnesses, uh, obviously Chairman Bernanke, uh, found himself in an odd situation of saying, although <coughs> Mr. Cuomo had said that the threat that you had said, and I'll quote it as best I can, sec from his letter, Secretary Paulson has informed us that he made the threat at the request of Chairman Bernanke. Now, that came from, uh, uh, from Cuomo's office, and I apologize uh, that his work was a little sloppy. We get a letter, but we, there's no transcript, there's no written record, so we have to take his interpretation of your statements, and that's one of the reasons you're here today. We also dealt with uh, Ken Lewis, uh, who came here with a situation in which he had received a threat by your own statements, and, uh, and yet he had to say that the threat was not the reason that he went through with a bad deal, for if he had said that, then the, uh, the Ohio uh, pension funds and others that have sued saying that the merger diminished their ownership, uh, their asset value in uh, in Bank of America, would have in fact had their lawsuit go forward much more readily. So each of you before you have been in an odd situation. You're uniquely positioned to help us. One, you've told us yes, you did issue the threat. Two, you believe that it was reasonable. And I want to put it in perspective just for a moment. Uh, perhaps for histor historical purposes, go back to. Uh, the first Gulf War of 1990, in which Margaret Thatcher said to uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush, don't go wobbly on me, George, when she felt that, uh, that he was not prepared to pursue a war against Saddam after he invaded and brutally uh, treated the people of Kuwait. This was not a war, but this was an emergency situation. Your threat is admitted. Your threat was because you felt that there were clearly uh, uh, disaster if they, went, if they didn't go forward with it. After I, one more thing, I'd like to ask you to, to elaborate on that and how Mr. Cuomo came to give us the line he did. As I, my understand is, had, had the MAC clause been completely valid, 
had Ken Lewis renegotiated, had uh, they agreed to a new terms or to a breakup, isn't it true that, in fact, we would have had a long period of time, well, notice, statutory notice of, for stockholders, and then a stockholder vote occurred? Yeah, there is. If, if there had been a renegotiation, there would have been an extended period, uh, and there would have been a revote, is my understanding. And isn't it that which is at the center of why you issued the threat and why Ken Lewis ultimately decided that the damage from that period, even if he got a better price or broke it, either way could be disastrous to both firms? Well, uh, the reason, and again, I don't, uh, Ken Lewis didn't characterize it as a threat, and I. And I no, actually, he, he didn't care. He did characterize it as a threat. He managed to say that he didn't feel threatened yeah. while receiving a threat. Yeah. I, 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 I prefer to characterize it as me explaining the Fed's supervisory authorities to him, but, but in any event, whatever we. However, I like Margaret Thatcher's uh, way of doing uh, it however, myself. However, we characterize it that the, the 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 concern that that I had was that the Mac clause wasn't uh, a, a legally viable option there, there, there's there's no precedent for it there's no there, there's no basis for it and so doing that would have just uh, would have uh, been it, it would have shown a, uh, a lack of judgment, and I, I think it uh, would have uh, uh, really undermined the viability of, of, of B of A and uh, Merrill Lynch and the financial system. Well, the, uh, uh, going back to uh, Mr. Cuomo's characterization of what you had to say, if you can help us, if you will, thread the needle between these two, uh, and uh, uh, before my time is up, I want to ask one other question, sort of an easy one. Would you say that effectively, no matter what the reason, the viability of the MAC, you were saying the equivalent of what Margaret Thatcher said to George W. Bush, which is stay the course, get this done, it's better to do it right now than not? Yeah, I, let, me, let me go to, um, to ex explaining the, uh, the confusion with Secretary Cuomo's office. It's really quite simple because... The Fed had invoked a privilege that kept me from uh, recounting my conversation with Ben Bernanke to Cuomo's office. So if it hadn't been for that Fed privilege, I would have told and would have said to the Secretary, you know, to, to uh, Attorney General Cuomo's office exactly what I, I'm saying here today. And so I think the the it's really quite understandable that you know that this discrepancy in light of the fed in light of the fed privilege and right after uh attorney general cuomo's uh, a letter came out i made a public statement where i said that the my prediction of what could happen to to lewis and the board that was for me those were my words but it was based upon what i understood to be the, the fed's very strong Opposition to B of A renouncing the deal. Now, with uh, and now to your last question, I was attempting to send a very strong message to Ken Lewis in terms of how strongly the Fed and Treasury viewed this matter, and so and it wasn't just the words that. Uh, about the, the Fed supervisory powers, the, the, the other language uh, which I presented at that time, which again, very strong uh, message on the legal, you know, the lack of, uh, of the MAC being a legally viable option, very strong message uh, on it being a lack of judgment, and a very strong message on what I believed and what the Fed believed this would due to Bank America and uh, Merrill Lynch in the financial markets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, now you five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Paulson, in your testimony, <clears throat> you justify telling Mr. Lewis that the government might remove Bank of America management if they terminated the deal to acquire Merrill Lynch. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
You state, quote, such an action would show a colossal lack of judgment and would jeopardize Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and the financial system, unquote. Secretary, yeah. if a lack of management judgment merits decisive governmental action, what about potential violations of the law? Mr. Paulson, were you aware of concerns felt at the Fed and Treasury that Ken Lewis's, Ken Lewis's management team failed to do due diligence in acquiring Merrill Lynch and possibly violated securities laws by withholding material information from his shareholders to get the vote for the merger with Merrill? I, I was, I, I become aware uh, from some of the emails that this committee has uh, released and other documents. Did you know at that time? That there were concerns. And I, I, I know that there were some concerns. At that time, by, did you know, by, Mr. By Secretary? Sta by staff members, some concerns at that time as to whether how, uh, you know, along the lines of what you expressed on due diligence. I had not heard uh, concerns at that time about uh, securities laws. Now, Chairman Bernanke testified here that he shared those concerns about Bank of America's management. Did you share the concerns with anyone? Uh, in terms of concerns about Bank of America's management, here's what I would say about management. That, and uh, Congressman, I have been involved and was involved in at least three situations when I was at Treasury where CEOs were replaced. Fannie, Freddie, AIG. Did, well, uh, let me ask you this on that point. Did, did in 2008, did you ever inform the management of any systemically significant bank that they would be forced out for any reason? Well, I would say this. Here's, here's the calculus. You have to ask yourself, is this management capable of running the firm, and is there someone else there that, or someone else you know of that can do a better job? And I, I would say that these large, complex financial institutions are not easy to run, and it's not easy to find strong people to run them during a financial crisis. Well, you know, I just want to say this, Mr. Paulson, and you know, we have a limited time here, so I, I you know, appreciate you answering these questions. The investigators of this committee have reviewed tens of thousands of pages, including notes of conversations you participated in, where the federal response to Bank of America's problems was crafted. These documents clearly show that you were an advocate of aggressive fiscal response. You advocated for a large cash injection, a very large asset protection plan. But nowhere in these documents did we find evidence that you advocated for holding Bank of America's management accountable for failing to do due diligence and for, for withholding potentially material information from shareholders. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, did you, in fact, advocate for requiring such accountability as a condition of the bailout you were developing? I advocated the accountability we put in place, which was we treated Bank of America like Citigroup. Uh, we treated them differently than those that went to the TARP the first time. So we had uh, tougher restrictions on executive comp, and we had uh, provisions on foreclosure mitigation. But in terms of re replacing uh, the, the, the CEO, in this situation, it was, the, it was my judgment and it was the judgment of their regulator that, that it was appropriate to keep Mr. Lewis, uh, it was that this is a decision that's made by the board of directors and for, well, for regulators to come in and decide to replace them, we didn't think that was appropriate. Now, Mr. Paulson, as you know, invoking the MAC, however ill-considered it would have been, was not against the law. Meanwhile, Bank of America's decision to withhold material information about a merger from shareholders and their failure to do due diligence are potential violations of law. Perhaps you can explain to this committee how a Secretary of the Treasury can justify punishing an unwise but lawful act while ignoring potentially illegal ones. Well, in, in terms of leg legality... Could, could you speak closer to the mic? Yeah, I, I would say in terms of legality, I, I think that's... I, I'm, I'm not... I, I certainly don't feel qualified to, to, to sit here and opine on whether, uh, w whether there was an illegal action. 
and I, I certainly have not uh, not seen evidence of, a, of of an illegal action, and that is, in in terms of the the re relationship between B of A and 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 uh, the, the the capital markets and. Uh, the relationship between B of A and the SEC. I think that's that, that's that's a matter for others to opine on. Uh, time thank you, Mr. I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Ohio. Chairman. Um, I think as as I look at this, I think when most people look at this, that they, they see a clear pattern of deception and intimidation. I don't think there's anyone in this room who doesn't believe that you guys intimidated Mr. Lewis. I think it starts starts at the October 13th meeting when you called the nine biggest banks to Washington. They didn't know what the meeting was about. The whole meeting took 45 minutes. You slide a piece of paper across. They have to sign it and write in the amount of TARP money they're going to take. And I think it continues. And, and, but my biggest concern is this, again, what I've, what I've said is, is, a, is a pattern of deception. Because, I mean, and this is the concern. I think American people need to see this situation because it sheds light on where we're headed. We got car czar, pay czar, 21 other czars. We got auto task force. We got uh, unprecedented involvement by the government in the private sector and, and coming soon to families across America. We got this comparative effectiveness boards want to decide what kind of health care you got to get. So it's important we see what happens when you give this kind of involvement to the federal government. So I just want to walk you through a series of, of things that took place in this, in this acquisition and then ask you a question at the end. First of all, I want to start with the, what some people would describe as an exaggeration. You said the world was going to end, everything was going to be terrible if, in fact, this deal didn't get completed. And yet there are people at the Fed, like Mr. Ashcraft, who said the doomsday predictions were, quote, little over the top. You timed, you timed the release of information, so you kept the American public in the dark. You, would, you only gave verbal assurances to Mr. Lewis. You wouldn't put anything in writing. You didn't want that out. You made sure that uh, your, your, Ken Lewis's testimony to Attorney General Cuomo, he said, Mr. Paulson said, we don't want a disclosable event. We have the Angelo uh, uh, email which said, we want to, if Merrill decides to file early, we want to steer Merrill to a later filing debate. So you controlled when the American people could get this information, even though you're using $700 billion of their, their money. You deceived the regulators. We have uh, the Attorney General's letter to Congress and I quote, Secretary Paulson did not keep the SEC chairman in the loop during discussions and negotiations with the Bank of America. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency was also kept in the dark. We have letters, uh, 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 email from, the, uh, from Brian Peters from the, from the New York Fed, where he's talking about an upcoming conference call, and he's, quote, given the presence of the OCC on the call, I think we should not discuss or reference the call with Ken Lewis and Secretary Paulson. Maybe most importantly, and I just want to read from our staff did good work. I want to read from the, the memo they put together. Uh, you kept the Financial Stability Oversight Board in the dark as well. And let me just read this. Not only did Mr. Paulson and Mr. Bernanke deliberately keep the SEC and OCC in the dark about events at Bank of America and Merrill Lynch, you also failed to raise the issue at two consecutive meetings of the Financial Stability Oversight Board, which Congress established to bring oversight to TARP. According to the minutes of these F FSOB meetings, it was not until the January 15th meeting that you and Mr. Bernanke informed the board of the government's plans for additional bailouts of Bank of America in connection with the Merrill Lynch merger. So again, you claim that failing to force the merger would have had catastrophic effect on financial stability, yet it wasn't worth revealing to the Financial Stability Oversight Board. So you got financial instability is going to happen, but you're not going to reveal what's going on to the Financial Stability Oversight Board. And then the last example I would point to is one I started with. Go back to the October 13th meeting. You deceived the banks involved with this. You, I mean, this is based on Ken Lewis's testimony. I've asked this question, uh, talked about this both with him and with, and with Fed Chairman Bernanke. You called the nine biggest banks to, to Washington. They don't know what the meeting's about. The whole meeting takes 45 minutes. They said on one, he described the meeting. They, they said on one side, you, Mr. Geithner, Mr. Bernanke, uh, Ms. Baer said on the other side, and you basically tell them they're going to take TARP money, like it or not. And so I have one question, and, and this, I think this is critical. That was on October 13th, that meeting. I want to go back to October 3rd, because that's when this whole thing started. When we started down this bailout road, this bailout fever that's grabbed Washington, it frankly started on October 3rd when the Congress of the United States decided to give you $700 billion of taxpayer money. And the whole premise of that action was that you were going to take that money and you were going to go buy the troubled and toxic assets. You were going to clean things up and things were going to get back on the right track. And yet, to date, the Treasury has not purchased those assets. So I want to know... When did you know that you could not be able to do what you told Congress? I remember hearing the, uh, sitting in on the conference calls with you and Mr. Bernanke. I remember when you came in front of lawmakers and you talked about, we're going to buy these troubled assets. 
and yet less than, or actually 10 days later, you would change direction completely and instead just inject the capital uh, into uh, the institution. So did you deceive Congress before the October 3rd vote, Mr. Paulson? Yeah, let me... Uh, and again, pretty clear pattern of, of what's taking place. Well, uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have time to respond to, to, to every Paulson, question you asked to you. Or, or every statement you made, many of which I uh, disagree with. But, but, but let me... Uh, get to the TARP, because I think that's that, that's critical. We went to Congress, and when we asked for authority to buy illiquid assets, we also recognized we needed flexibility. And we worked with Congress to make sure that we had the flexibility to deal with whatever we had coming at us. Congress, I believe, knew they were giving us this flexibility, and and thank goodness they did give us that flexibility. Now, what happened in the, the last few days before we got the TARP legislation, which passed on October 3rd, and in the week after we got the TARP legislation, the markets continued to freeze up. We had a whole series of bank failures overseas. Five or six different countries had to intervene to, to rescue their banks. Market participants were clamoring for us to do something quickly. We needed to do something quickly. And the way we were able to do something quickly and make a difference and make a dramatic difference and prevent something That's very true. dire from happening was to, to, to make the change and inject capital. And, and I would say one other thing. I think subsequent events have proven unequivocally that, that there is not an easy, quick way to purchase illiquid assets. So when did I... When did I come to the conclusion that we would uh, we, we needed to move and do something? It was uh, sometime. It was a it was sometime a between October third and October thirteenth. Well, it obviously. wasn't. No, it was not or a. That, my question is: Was it before October third? It wasn't. I, I would say. Would you disagree? Wouldn't you say the the the, the main point that you and Mr. Bernanke sold, and I didn't go along with this, I thought it was a crazy plan. The main point you sold to the Congress of the United States was we were going to go in and buy these uh, toxic troubled assets. Well, I, I would say this. That, would you agree? Yeah, that, was the, that was the main point. That was and it changed in 10 days. That, well, let me say this. That was, that was the main thrust, and that's what we talked about. But we, from the beginning, wanted flexibility. Congress wanted to give us flexibility. It was very good that Congress gave us flexibility. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ken Jorsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I, I'm not sure that the committee here isn't uh, having this examination to find out whether we could promote the shareholders' interest of Bank of America. That seems to be what you potentially uh, violated, but I'm going to give you an opportunity, since this is your first testimony before the Congress, to be a little more explicit and uh, descriptive of the situation that happened in September 15th, the 18th, and then on October 3rd by act of Congress processes were taken so that we can return. You heard my colleagues on the other side seem to suggest that you overreacted that there was a uh, uh, exaggeration of difficulty and that in, in some way abuse of power occurred on behalf of yourself and the President and this Congress in acting precipitously in the fall of 08 in this disaster. Now we've had the occasion to have uh, Chairman Bernanke before this committee and before the Financial Committee on three or four times and I always ask the question of him to make sure we restate that picture and that the American people have a chance to understand what happened. And I dare say for criticism, I think both yourself and Chairman Bernanke and the new Secretary of Treasury have failed to inform adequately the American people as to what meltdown meant. I remember those vital days and some of those meetings and telephone conference calls that we all participated in, and some of the descriptions. And I, I don't want to provide that testimony, but I'm hoping that maybe you may remember whether questions of law and order were asked, whether questions of the capacity to feed the American people for what period of time were asked. 
I'm not going to say what I remember the answer to be, but I think when you give the description now, something dire had to be st uh, stopped from happening. That's great for you to understand that and those of us that were there. But that doesn't mean a damn thing to the American people. And as we move through this, you can see committee members here don't quite understand what the situation of September, October, November, and December of 08 was like. Right. Please take moments now well, to describe as fully in detail as you can what were the projections that could happen to not only the United States but the world in a period of 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, and how that would comport to what life would be like if no action were taken. Okay. Congressman, uh, thank you for the question. And one of the issues we dealt with at the time was the more explicit we were, Ms. Ms. the more Paulson. graphic we were, Ms. the Ms. more Paulson. this would Ms. terrify Paulson. the American people, yeah. the Paulson. more it would terrify the American people and lead to an even greater economic problem. And so we were, as we were attempting to explain this, it was there was this there was this conflict. We didn't want to overly scare people and make it worse. Well, now take the okay. opportunity to scare okay. people. Okay, okay, okay. Well, tell them the well, truth. I, I, I mean, would, we've got uh, to deal with the American people uh, now and uh, some uh, of our fellow members uh, right. who think that this was a facade of some sort that it didn't really happen well, that we weren't in jeopardy. Well, if if you have a situation where a banking system is frozen and money can't move between financial institutions, what? What, what ultimately happens is that every business, even businesses that seem to be solid and small businesses across America will not be able to fund their inventory. They won't be able to meet their payroll. Uh, that you will, you, you will have a, when a, when a financial system breaks down, the, the, the kinds of numbers that we were looking at in terms of unemployment was much greater than the numbers we're looking at now. People in the streets, and of course around the world, uh, it, it is very significant because I, I remember talking with, uh, for instance, German leaders who were explaining to me that uh, that people in the old East. Uh, uh, were unhappy with the big discrepancies in wealth, but they at least believed in the system and believed in some form of market-driven uh, uh, capitalism. But that uh, that that if we had a meltdown uh, of the system, it, it just could even lead. It just could lead to, to chaos or people people even questioning the, the basic system, and so. There was. Let me let me put it a little more succinctly because we are running out of time. Yeah. Mr. Pulse, I was in New York the other day and I had this very discussion with a lot of your former colleagues yep. on Wall Street, and we talked about what could have happened if, if the president, if yourself, and if the Congress had not taken action. And the one member I remember sitting at the panel described it, that he said that the people that have talked about we would have gone back to the 16th century were being optimistic. Well, it is, I, I try not to use hyperbole and explain something that is, it, it's impossible to ever prove now that it didn't happen. But at least I believe, I had, when, when we had this debate, I had some people say, well, listen, look at everything that's been in place since the Great Depression. We can't have that, you know, we certainly couldn't go through that again. I looked at it the opposite. When I looked at in a world where information can flow, money can move with the, uh, with the speed of light electronically, looked how fast this liquidity went, looked at the ripple effect, and looked at how f when, a, when a financial system fails, a whole country's uh, economic system can fail. I, I believe we, we, we could have been uh, gone back to, to the sorts of situations we saw uh, saw in the Depression. I, I remember asking uh, Ben Bernanke what he thought the world would look like, and he said, well, just take a look at what happened in the Depression. But I didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about that because I knew it was going to be very bad, and I never wanted to experience very bad. I didn't want to ever 
get to the point where we where, where we could where we could really understand it. But the gentleman's time has long expired, yeah. so let me uh, move to uh, Congressman Burton from Indiana. Mr. Paulson, there are those of us that uh, uh, don't agree with your analysis that uh, uh, going about solving this problem was the correct way. You know, if you look at the, you talk about a meltdown. We have 9.5% unemployment right now. If you take into consideration those who are working part-time or who are getting unemployment compensation, it's closer to 16.5%. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal. So you're talking about how you guys saved the economy and saved the world. Uh, we do have a meltdown going on right now. And if you don't believe it, go out to Indiana and look at some of the parts of my district. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. First of all, uh, I asked Mr. Bernanke if he talked to you about uh, telling Mr. Lewis if they uh, uh, used the MAC clause uh, that they were going to be fired. And he said he didn't give you any instruction or say anything to you about that. And yet when you spoke, uh, you said that uh, in, your, in your testimony, you said you were confident that that was a strong opinion of the Federal Reserve. How did you know that? The I mean, there must have been some communication. How did you know I mean, that, well, that you were I, confident that was their position? I, I, I would say... Two things there. First of all, you're right that I do not remember uh, Ben Bernanke ever suggesting to me that the you Fed. You don't remember. Could. You know, Mr. Bernanke said, said the but, same thing. He said but, he didn't but, but, remember. But what I, what I do, so you ask where I came away with that, with that view. Yeah. And I participated in a, a number of meetings and calls where. Chairman Bernanke participated. There were lawyers from the Fed, staff members from the Fed, uh, people from Treasury. And I came away from that, the, those calls with that understanding. Well, who's, wait, 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 wait. And, and, well, if you me, came let, away from that, from those let, phone let me calls. Just, let me well, just, no, listen, just a second. If you came away from that, from those phone calls, somebody must have said, hey, we can't let them do this. Well, I just, and I would suggest that it might have been Mr. Bernanke. Well, what, 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 I, what I would say to you, I do not know whether someone in those conversations or calls expressly said it or if my understanding came from just the tone and the forcefulness. Of you know, you're a very smart man. I don't think anybody's buying what you're saying right now. I mean, you, you, you guys were on a phone call. There was a number of conversations and emails, and you're saying that you didn't get any, any, uh, any uh, suggestion from Mr. Bernanke that... Uh, that he wanted you to let them know they were going to be fired if they didn't do what you said? I, I said I clearly came away with the understanding that this committee has, and which was substantiated by the emails that have been released and some of the other things, that that was the view of the Fed. But I, I also don't remember Ben Bernanke ever, ever talking about that possibility with me. It's interesting that both you and Mr. Bernanke can't remember uh, let me just uh, read something here that really concerns me. First of all, they expected a $9 billion liability. And a few days later, they found out it wasn't $9 billion, but $12 billion. And so they were very concerned that they weren't going to be able to swallow all of that, and that's why they said they wanted to change this and, and, and use the MAC uh, uh, provision. Uh, and you didn't want to make that public. Uh, you didn't want to make any of this public. Why not? Well, l l let me say to you that th that is not a fact. The only th – th this came up in connection with Ken Lewis asking me for a letter from Treasury. And what I said to him about a letter from Treasury is I said, Ken, we do not have – any kind of a specific agreement here. We don't, we haven't decided on the size of the program, the dollar amount. We haven't decided on w how many assets. And so if I gave a letter, all I would be saying well, is what I've already said publicly, which is that B of A is systemically important and that we are committed to, well, here, here's uh, what, here's to, what to not said. having a failure. Yeah, here's so, what, here, so my – so let me just well, finish. Don't here. use so, up all my time. So just, what uh, I said was just the opposite. Mr. I said if we give you a letter, Mr. Paulson, we'll disclose it. Mr. Paulson, please pull the mic closer to okay. you. Oh, sorry. If we give you a letter, we will disclose it, was well, what I said to you. Here, here's what was said in, in testimony. Bernanke and Paulson insisted that Lewis rely solely on their verbal assurance of more support because, as Paulson told Lewis in a, a written pledge, quote, would be a disclosable event 
and we do not want a disclo disclosable event. Well, and he goes into more de detail than that. Well, l let me say, Lewis has testified clearly before this committee that I never, ever suggested to him that he delay any disclosure. What I said to him was something I would expect you all would agree with, which is if we're going to issue a letter from the Treasury, I'm not going to issue a letter without disclosing that letter. And I don't see the point of a letter because we have no specific agreement. There's nothing to write down. We don't have the size of the program. We don't have the dollar amount. And we've already publicly you, you, said... You gave him verbal assurance, but you wouldn't put it in writing. I, I gave him verbal assurance of that we were committed to working to get Why something done. Why didn't you done. want to put it in writing? I mean, uh, there's several places where he says that you would not allow it to be put in writing. You didn't want people to know. You didn't want public disclosure. Why not? Well, because I, I, I attempted to answer. I'll answer it one more time for you, sir. What we, we, I had already Mr. said... Mr. Chairman, will you ask the witness again Excuse to me. speak I, in the I, microphone? I can't he, hear. Yeah. Mr. Paulson. Mr. I'm Paulson. sorry. I had already said publicly, as had the Fed, that we were committed to working to prevent the failure of any systemically important institution and Bank of America was one. Now, going beyond that, we had had made it clear that we were going to be working with him to develop a support program, but we didn't have a size, we didn't have the amount of assets that would be recover covered, we, had, we didn't know what form of equity and how much, we had nothing to de definitive to say. And so I said, I don't see how a letter is going to be meaningful or helpful, but if I give you a letter, we're going to disclose it. And then that got twisted around to say I didn't want a disclosure. I know my time's up. Let me just read one thing real quick, Mr. Chairman. Here's what he said. I was instructed that, quote, we do not want a public disclosure. That's what he said, flat out. Well, he has, he has testified something different before this committee. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Time Chairman. Is, could, in, um, in, no, I'm the, sorry. His time has expired. Well, I have a procedural question. Uh, that Mr. Paulson clearly is moving back and forth. Is there enough slack in the mic? The mic could be pulled yeah, more to the edge. Yeah, of the here table. we go. I got it. If you pull it back that direction, maybe one. Thanks. Th thank you very, very much. You know, we have Mr. Paulson, we have having problems hearing you. Yeah, okay. good. But the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to go back to the line of questioning suggested by Mr. Jordan of Ohio. Uh, I also sit on the Financial Services Committee. You testified at least a half a dozen times before that committee uh, prior to the, the TARP vote. Uh, you did indeed, in, in all of your testimony, along with Mr. Bernanke, uh, express the intent, the central intent of this TARP program was to buy toxic assets uh, to get the economy moving again and to get, get folks lending again. And you pounded away at that central theme. And what Mr. Jordan was saying, that a matter of days went by and, and you changed completely the focus of that program. Now, in my opinion, you misled Congress. When you were asked by Mr. Bacchus in the Financial Services Committee, he said, wouldn't it be uh, more impactful, I'm paraphrasing, to just inject the money directly in the banks and, you did, and what was your response? I, I believe I said right there that... You that said I, that wouldn't work. We, you dismissed that. You well, dismissed that in open committee. Right. Which, which led members of Congress to believe that you weren't going to do that. Now, now, hear me out. If you had come up here with Mr. Bernanke and said, I got a plan, I want to take $800 billion in taxpayer money, I want to give it to my pals and the nine biggest banks of America, how many votes do you think you would have got up here? And that's, that's why, that's why I believe you have misled Congress. Let me ask you something else. This conversation that you had, uh, you had a conversation December 26th, 22nd, I believe it was, with, uh, with Mr. Lewis. According to his testimony, you were on a bike ride. And he yeah. says that you... You spoke to him. Uh, you, you were on a bicycle. He was able to, 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 uh, to catch up to you. Well, which date was this? I'm sorry? What, what date was this? 
December 21st or 22nd? I actually have in my notes. I was. I happened to be out uh, uh, skiing. It would have been an interesting bike ride. But. Well, well, he's saying you're on a bike. Well, whether you're on skis or on a bicycle, okay. that, that's not important. Yeah. I want to know what yeah. you said. What did you say to him directly? What was? Give me the gist of this conversation. Uh, paraphrase it if you must, but but tell me what you said to him. Uh, w- which conversation on the 21st? Because I had two conversations with him on the 21st. Well, the one in which he says that. Uh, You stated uh, that there was a real threat or the real uh, uh, possibility, I won't use the word threat, that he could be removed and the board could be removed uh, under the emergency Fed power, not not by Treasury. That conversation. Okay. Okay. This this conversation was one where where I said to him, number one, that the... Uh, that the Treasury and the Fed have communicated publicly that we are committed to prevent the failure of systemically important institutions, and Bank of America definitely is one, uh, number one. Secondly, that, uh, that, that we believed that the exercise of a MAC clause uh, would show a lack of judgment, and if he did so, this is what you said to him. Yes, and, yeah. if, he, and, okay. if, he, and, and if he did so, it would uh, could destabilize both the uh, destabilize Bank America, Merrill Lynch, and the financial system. And under those circumstances, the Federal Reserve could replace management and the board. Did you have a conversation with Mr. Bernanke uh, prior to this that you were going to have this conversation and? Uh, I put it on the line like this? I, I had the, the, the conversation I had with uh, Ben Bernanke. I had a, did have a conversation before this with Ben Bernanke. I, I had received a call from Ken Lewis telling me that he had been giving more thought to the situation, and he and his board were increasingly concerned and uh, were, were, were considering exercising the MAC clause. And I had a conversation with Ben Bernanke beforehand. But I will say to you, I had had so many conversations with Ben Bernanke, I have a trouble distinguishing one call from another. And, and, and the call I had with him was not one where we're saying, now let's get our script down. I had a conversation with Ben Bernanke, told him that I had heard from, from, from Lewis, and then, then afterwards I... Uh, I got back to Lewis with a conversation I just gave to you. Let me ask you, either on skis or on bicycle, was anybody with you uh, when you, you made this call? I made the call from, no, I made the call from my living room in a, in, in a ski cabin in Colorado. And there was nobody else in the room at the time? I, unless one of the kids were running through the, uh, or one of the grandchildren, but uh, other than that, I, I think I was by myself. All right. My time has expired. I yield back. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Paulson, you just uh, spoke about uh, some conversations uh, with Mr. Lewis. And uh, let's, if I could just clarify, um, I guess Mr. Lewis claims that he first learned of the $12 billion financial loss at uh, Merrill Lynch on December 14th. Uh, at, at, which was uh, nine days after the shareholder vote. Now, you just testified that uh, he called uh, you at that point and told you he was strongly considering backing out. Is that what you were referring to just a moment ago? Or was it a conversation uh, later on December 21st when Lewis informed you that he was considering backing out because of financial losses uh, at, at Merrill Lynch? Well, well we had... There's two conversations, one earlier, which is shortly after their board meeting, when he first indicated, and a second time. Do you well, recall? Yeah, there were multiple conversations. The, the, uh, the, the first call was the first time I had any inkling of the problem was uh, on December 17th. And th- that's when he called. And well, he, he, he said on the 14th uh, well, that he, he called you, and that's what we have information. Well, then there's another conversation on the 21st that um, 
uh, he, he was, again, very seriously moving towards uh, getting out of the deal because of what he had learned. And he said that is when you threatened uh, to remove him and the board of directors at Bank of America. Do you, do you recall threatening him in one of those conversations? Well, well I, I don't characterize it as a threat. I clearly uh, recall on the December 21st I explaining to him that... So you did not threaten him, I, 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 uh, either to remove him or the board uh, of directors? I, no. What I've testified here today is that, uh, that that I sure explained to him that the Fed could remove management and the board of directors. Well, you, that, you told folks uh, that all hell would broke loose if they backed out of the deal. Is that correct? I d didn't use those words, but uh, but I sure told them it would be a very serious problem and it would cr create a financial havoc. But there, wa there were backup plans. Uh, were you aware of those backup plans? Did you disclose the backup plans or ever mention that you, you had any alternative to Lewis? I, I don't know what you're speaking of in terms of backup plans. Well, uh, it's my understanding that, uh, that you had information uh, relating to a uh, possible backup plan by a Brit, uh, Br British uh, regulatory authority, and that there were backup plans if, in fact, uh, uh, they didn't go through with the deal. You're not aware of any backup uh, plan. I don't know what that you, was the only option. The the I don't know what the the uh, you know we we certainly had uh, we we had our tarp, and we were we were low on uh, capacity in the tarp, but we. I, I don't know anything about British. Well, we, well uh, I have information here we'll put in the record. Uh, we've, ha we've had uh, recent discussions with uh, BAC and ML management who contend that they uh, have the required shareholder supporter and confident that a transaction will be approved uh, with the, tomorrow's vote. If approval is withheld, ML will continue to have access to the various facilities and programs currently in place in the United States. Additionally, it is, respons it is reasonable to expect that ML would uh, be provided uh, necessary support to preclude sufficient sy systemic uh, disruption. Are you aware of that? I, I assume people are just, that you're, you're talking about a board report where they're talking about uh, access to Fed lines or the, the fact from, that we've got from a the Richmond Fed to the UK. Yeah, I'm I'm not aware of that. You're not aware that, and and you were never aware of any backup plan. You, the only thing, and you and you never threatened uh, Lewis to remove uh, him or well, his board. I, you keep putting words in my mouth. I, I I've, I've I've now told you three times and told the committee repeatedly that of course I told Lewis that that we would, uh, the Fed had the authority and could replace uh, Lewis and the board. So you did tell him that you had the authority to remove him that, 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 and I, the I board. Told, I told him that the Federal Reserve could replace him and the board if, uh, if, if he uh, pursued the course of invoking the MAC. And again, uh, for the record, you are not aware, you're telling this committee you're not of any, aware of any contingency or backup plans other than, than uh, uh, you're holding uh, Mr. Lewis and the board to uh, the deal that you wanted to impose. I, I'm saying that our, 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 my, my plan and my preparedness was to get ready with the support package when the company announced the earnings. Mr. Chairman, in, I have uh, in, some in information. Contrary to what the witness is testifying, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent that that be made part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Right. Yield back. The, 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 uh, yield to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, Congressman Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Paulson, uh, I guess I want to put this in context of... Uh, what didn't happen with Lehman. And I believe the expression you used was uh, moral hazard, which is the notion of bailing out institutions, uh, inviting more risk taking. Uh, is that a concept, is that a term you'd now not use anymore? 
No, I think moral, uh, moral hazard is a very important concept, and I do think would we have a regulatory system that's in balance and you have the wind down powers that the administration is requesting and hopefully Congress will pass that lets a non-bank institution fail without disrupting the system that uh, that it'll be uh, that moral hazard will be will have more teeth in it so why was Lehman a moral hazard and not Bear Stearns Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, AIG? Okay, I would actually th th thank you for the question. Uh, that we, I, I believe quite strongly that if we, if, uh, if, if uh, Tim Geithner, Ben Bernanke, and Hank Paulson had found something legal we could have done to save Lehman, we would have. And uh, let me explain the difference. The, um, in Lehman Brothers, there was a liquidity problem and a capital problem, and we were unable to find any buyer to come in and uh, make the acquisition on a, an assisted basis or an unassisted basis. And so, although the Fed was able to loan against Lehman Collateral and did loan to help facilitate liquidation and bankruptcy, a Fed loan would not have saved Lehman Brothers. In, in the case of Bear Stearns, we had a buyer, J.P. Morgan, and J.P. Morgan, then the, the Fed was able to make a loan to assist that acquisition. Uh, Bear Stearns, there was a liquidity problem and a capital problem, and J.P. Morgan took care of the capital problem. They were able to to guarantee the trading book while the merger was being voted on. AIG was a different situation because in AIG, the perception at the time was this is a liquidity problem only because we had, they had a number of stable regulated insurance companies that were perceived to be well capitalized and were collateral for the, for, for the loan. So we faced a situation in Lehman Brothers where we did not have, uh, the government didn't have wind down powers, the government didn't have powers to inject capital, that came after we got the TARP, and we didn't have a buyer. And so there was no power that we could find to solve both the liquidity and the capital but problem. Did Bank, did Bank of America request your assistance to purchase Lehman? Did Bank America? Yes. We went to Bank America repeatedly, uh, and Bank America asked each time for more assistance, and we had the we had the private sector ready to to fill the gap, but the uh, but Bank America, in my judgment was never serious about it because each time they showed less interest and it turns out they were uh, they, they were interested in Merrill Lynch. We had another buyer, Barclays, that we thought was going to do the deal right up until Sunday morning. Well, when, get, let me just ask one more question given the short time frame. Most of these other groups that were saved, AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the management was replaced. Lewis wasn't replaced. Was his situation di different, or did, in, in short, did you promise him he could keep his job if he did it this way? Absolutely not. The uh, these are th these decisions for 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 the government to come in and take the responsibility away from the board and replace the board. There's got to be a very good reason. And Fannie, Freddie, AIG, there was good reasons, but. I also looked at this very pra pragmatically and said, these are big, difficult institutions to run. Is the current CEO, is he capable of running this institution? And, and then you've got to say, who else is suitable to come in and run these institutions? And I appreciate it. My time is up. I guess you, you could see how that appears to be splitting hairs of who you fire and who you don't fire. And it, and it could very easily be construed to those who are making these decisions in these financial institutions 
that their first course, their first thought must be that they have to listen to whatever you say. They have to play ball, or because you have such discretion, you know, those who play ball keep their jobs and those that don't get fired. The gentleman, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Chaffet from Utah. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Secretary Paulson, for being here. I, I appreciate it. Uh, when, when this country experienced Enron, the, there was outrage from coast to coast, people who were not informed about uh, the material uh, uh, things that were happening and not happening within that, within that uh, company because the shareholders were, were left in the dark. Um, my, my concern is the lack of transparency of the, to the shareholders and to the public at large, not only as investors but, uh, but as investors, uh, as shareholders, if you will, uh, as being taxpayers in this country. So the question that I have, I want to get follow up on Mr. Jordan's question, a little deeper into why you did not share this information with other regulatory agencies, for instance, the SEC. Why didn't you feel compared to share information with them? First of all, we, we were working with the regulators that were in, involved with putting the financial assistance together. That was the effort. The, the, uh, the but, new, there, but, but, but the, the responsibility, it is, it is not a Treasury Secretary's job to get between a company and its uh, and the SEC, for instance, uh, well, looking my, my at disclosure. That, that I've been around long enough to know these are critically important decisions, and that's the re responsibility of a CEO working with his general counsel and with and with the regulator. That's not. But you were a participant in the Financial Stability Oversight Board. I mean, part of the, one of the requirements with TARP was that the, the Financial Stability Oversight Board, in which you had two meetings and you did not inform the SEC, nor did you inform the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Well, Why is that? Well, let, let me be because I, I take exception with that. The um, in. Uh, after a January 8th meeting of the Financial Stability Board, I sat down with Chairman Chris Cox and I explained to him, uh, it was still early, we didn't have the package together, but we were working on it, and I, I gave him the details of the, the, to the extent we knew them at that time. So on January, yeah, no, I mean, this thing was fully baked at so, that point. That was pretty uh, late it, in the game. It, it let, was, let me go back to what. No, this, let me, this was not. Pardon me. Let me go back to what uh, Attorney General Andrew Cuomo said. Quote that he told Congress in his April 23rd letter that Hank Polson quote informed this office that he did not keep the SEC chairman in the loop during the discussions and negotiations with the Bank of America in December 2008. Uh, Is that true or not true? Well, what what uh, what Attorney General Cuomo's office was talking about was said. The question was in December. I I also explained to the Attorney General in January. In and, and again, the, and again the, this was. And, is and this, the Attorney General's statement true or not true? This, the, the, I'll read it to you again. Quote, informed this office that he did not keep the SEC chairman in the loop during the discussions and negotiations with the Bank of America in December 2008. In, in December, I did not. That's absolutely correct. And you feel no obligation. The, the one agency that is out there as an advocate for the, for the uh, shareholders, you didn't think that that was an important effort on your part or... Yeah, you yeah, didn't feel any obligation to share with the SEC or other regulatory yeah, agencies, again, even the one within your own agency, the Office uh, of uh, the Comptroller of the Concer uh, Currency. I, I would, again, let me say two things to make it separate because you've, you've, you've blurred two things. First of all, w with regard to the relationship of Bank of America to the SEC, that is something that is not my responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the Fed. That's the role of Bank America to work with the SEC. But the, but the with, with the financial did, did, for, for, with the with the Financial Stability Oversight Board, because this has come up now several times. Right. We did not ha begin to have this together until we brought it to the Financial Stability Board, and there was a full and thorough airing there. And but, but when but, was that? Was so I, far after these deals were already cut. These deals were not cut. These deals were not cut. That's where there's a misunderstanding. There was an understanding that we were going to work to get something done, but we had nothing specific to bring forward. I, and the other point I made was on January 8th, in his role as a member of the Financial Stability Oversight Board, I gave uh, Chris Cox a briefing. I, I, I think, Mr. Chairman, what needs to be explored further is that 
I wasn't here. I'm a freshman. I, you wouldn't have wanted me here because I would have voted against uh, this TARP. I, th I think it's an absolute disaster. But I got to tell you that I think this uh, Congress or the Congress before this did set up uh, this Financial Stability Oversight Board to precisely make sure there wasn't this uh, audacity of arrogance that there w would be held in just one or two piece, uh, person's hands and that there would be more involvement from other agencies that are very relevant and to exclude the one agency that is shared and, and that is tasked with taking care of shareholders I, I think is inexcusable and I think we need to dive into further I see that my time's uh, expired thank you Mr. Pullman, uh, Polson and thank you Mr. Chairman thank you very much uh, I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, Congressman Welch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Uh, Mr. Paulson, I was on that uh, call, I think, September, October, when you informed Congress, uh, you and Mr. Bernanke, uh, of the dire uh, condition in the financial markets. And uh, my understanding of what your goals were in Mr. Bernanke at that time were to do basically three things. One, stabilize the financial system. Number two, eventually reform the system. Uh, and number three, uh, repay the taxpayer. Is that more or less a fair assessment or yes. summary? Yep. I, I want to go to this, and I share that concern about repaying the taxpayer. Uh, when the uh, deal with Bank of America went through, uh, the federal government, and you were very much a part of this, did two things to help in a stability effort. One was uh, the TARP payment of uh, $20 billion dollars and number two was the asset backing of these mortgage-backed securities of $118 billion, correct? Yep. And the intention was that the taxpayer get repaid on that $20 billion TARP payment. Uh, some firms have repaid, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan. Uh, and there was going to be an 8% interest rate paid to the taxpayer on preferred stock, correct? Well, well the, yes, on the, on, the, on, on the second round is 8%. And, and then there was a $118 billion backing by the U.S. government in a non-recourse loan that provided assurance to uh, the Bank of America shareholders and to the owners of these securities that the federal government would make good on them in the event that there was a collapse, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that it was the intention uh, of the Treasury Department uh, that the taxpayers be compensated for providing this guarantee, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that, that guarantee was going to be, uh, as I understand it, uh, in the form of a fee of about $4 billion, correct? Yeah, I've forgotten the precise number, but that sounds about right. That sounds about right. And that fee would be arrived at in the ordinary uh, course of what was the customary fee for such a guarantee program, correct? Yes. Uh, Mr. Lewis uh, is now, and, and you understood as in your capacity as Treasury Secretary, that in fact the American taxpayer was on the hook to backstop those loans if they went sour, correct? Well, I clearly understood that we had a term sheet uh, and that the deal wasn't finalized yet, but we were, you know, and then I left office before it was finalized. I understand that, but a deal's a deal, and uh, you shake hands, and that's all you need. Uh, and that's, you know, frankly, I think that's the way most Americans would be, okay. right? I would say on this one, I don't, I, I know where you're leading. I just was not, I don't have the details because. I'm not asking the details. I'm not sure why you it didn't. You as the Treasury it, Secretary uh, of the United States government, the person filling the shoes of Alexander Hamilton, would agree that when you give your word, you're going to keep your word. I would expect we would keep the word, but... And I think you would, and I give you credit for that. My question is this. Mr. Lewis apparently is now saying that there was no deal. He didn't sign it, even though he benefited by it. He doesn't want to pay back the American taxpayer for the benefit that the Treasury and the U.S. taxpayer provided. Is that the right thing for Mr. Lewis to do? Well, I don't know what the circumstances are. So I, I, don't, you know, I don't know why. I think the there's a lot of things you did well, and I think I understand you were trying to stabilize the situation. But this, frankly, I think is a simple yes or no. We put, we being the Treasury Department, the U.S. taxpayers, $118 billion of our money at risk. Bank of America took a great advantage of that because that provided stability and confidence. 
and now Mr. Lewis says he doesn't have to pay for it because somebody forgot to have the term sheet signed. Is that, is well, that well, acceptable well, to you? Well, 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 can I just explain what, don't, why I'm hedging on this? Because <laughs> I was part of doing a similar deal for Citigroup. And we, we had a term sheet, and then it was very difficult to get it done. And Citigroup wanted to get it done at least as much as the U.S. government, and it was hard to get it done. So what I don't know, if, if the circumstance was as you presented it, okay, then there would be one answer. But I do not know why, because I wasn't there. I don't, all I know is we had a term sheet, I left government, and the deal didn't close. Well, I mean, here's the bottom line on that, and this is one of the frustrations. A lot of us voted for that program. Right because we felt it was lesser of evils. We didn't want to. And I remember you on the phone call. Yeah. You actually were quite candid in saying the last thing in the world you wanted to do was come to the American taxpayer and ask right. for this bailout. But it was your honest judgment that if we didn't do it, there would be a calamity that would ripple across all of America. Right. So you went ahead. We did the same thing, in effect, with Bank of America. Now Mr. Lewis wants the benefit from the taxpayer commitment, the treasury commitment, and he doesn't want to pay, most Americans think a deal's a deal and they should pay. Well, I would say that if, if, if it was a deal, I would think he should pay. And no one was tougher than I was in trying to protect the American taxpayer. And so I, so I, and, and no one is looking at these programs more with hindsight more than I am in wanting the taxpayer to get the money back. Well, see, this, this is in so, hindsight. I mean, I, this is like a deal with a wink. Well, well, you know, the taxpayer made a handshake, we're going to cover it, and Mr. Lewis kind of had a wink or had his fingers crossed. I, I don't want to take the other side of your argument. I'm just simply being honest and saying okay. I do not know okay. why you, the deal didn't get well, done. Well, I'm sure you can and, appreciate And the deal could not get done for two reasons, it, three reasons. It could not get done because it was so complex people couldn't figure out how to get it done. It could not get done because he wanted out or it could not get out done because the government wanted out. And I don't know the answer. Okay. The gentleman's time is expired. All right. Expired. Thank you very much. Thank you, right. Mr. Paulson. I now yield time to the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Paulson, for being here and your, your description of um, the environment in which you were in and, um, and your actions. You know, it's interesting. We, when we have hearings, we basically try to do two things in hearings. Find out what happened and find out should it have happened, why did it happen, did, did, is this the appropriate action? That's the oversight. Why it happened is a, is a factual issue. Um, now, on the factual side, what we hear from you is that you, say, you don't deny that you told Mr. Lewis, don't renegotiate and don't back out. You disagree as to whether or not it was an actual threat for his removal being the consequences, but you told him, don't renegotiate, don't back out. And the why, you say, is because for the American people, you believe it was irresponsible that the interests of the shareholders of the Bank of America were the interest of the nation, which the financial markets were at risk, and apparently $12 billion is not material um, for you to believe that a material change had occurred, and you cite your vast experience. Now, you also say that you have taken actions, that there's been removal before. You cite the actions of Fannie, Freddie, and AIG on removal. Those were so different. You had failures of organizations. You didn't have just merely a business deal that was going forward. So they're really not comparable. I mean, I, I don't think you have an instance where you can provide us um, that's comparable where there's a threat from the Treasury Secretary for the purposes of removal um, of, a, um, of a CEO for a business transaction to go forward, unless there are other threats that you put forward that we're not yet aware of. Now, the thing about your vast experience that, that just really strikes me is that you really have no exact science with your vast experience. You cite the impact on the markets, your view of this deals, the impressions of how the markets might have an impression, which is not a science. There is no accounting problem from which you made your decision. There is no data point from which you made your decision. And with all the responsibilities that you had, which apparently somewhere around that time includes skiing, there was no way that you could have been up to speed on the economics, the due diligence, the specifics or the details of this deal to the extent of someone to intervene enough to say, do not renegotiate this deal, 
and do not back out. Now, I agree with Representative Lynch. I absolutely believe that you misled Congress. And I want to take you back to a meeting that you had with Cheney, yourself, Mr. Paulson, and Bernanke, where you came before the Republican conference to explain your $700 billion bailout deal, which I voted against. You came forward and told us that you were going to buy toxic assets, illiquid assets, and if these were not removed from the market, that we were going to have calamity, and that, that the crisis was those toxic assets were causing, again, the markets to have instability because the markets had the impression that these toxic assets, having no value, um, raised questions as to the value of the institutions. I thought it was a crock then, and, and I voted against it. And then you turned completely away from the toxic assets, and I believe that you were misrepresenting Congress. I don't think it was an issue of just asking for flexibility. I also voted against it because the deal was you didn't tell us who was going to get the money. You didn't tell us what the money was going to be used for. You didn't tell it was how much. And the part that was crucial to me is that you didn't step forward and say, these are the changes that need to be made in our regulatory systems and the laws to make certain that this never happened again. Now, the other thing that was important to me is that I believed that we were about to participate in the largest theft in history. I come from Ohio, ground zero for the mortgage foreclosure crisis. So when you were standing in front of us asking for $700 billion of taxpayers' money to back bail out what you called toxic, toxic assets, for these mortgage-backed securities as a result of the mortgage foreclosure crisis and the credit default swaps, I realized that you were asking me to give taxpayers money to bail out these people who I believe were systematically defrauding my community and the people who, who were buying houses and refinancing their houses with overvaluations. And I had a great concern, as did my community, that the underlying collateral for these mortgage-backed securities was not there. And that's ultimately what what took down the valuation of those mortgage-backed securities. So my question to you is, Mr. Paulson, in your vast amount of experience, since you were in this position in July of 2006, while the mortgage foreclosure crisis was raging throughout the country, and your description of people losing their homes was happening then, not just in 2008 when you stepped in with your TARP program, there were record foreclosures. Mortgage-backed securities were being traded with significant questions, I believe, in the market of the underlying value of the collateral. Subprime mortgage lending was spiraling. Refinances were increasing based on inflated and escalating property values. Where was your vast experience then, and what do you believe we should have done in 2006 to have stopped this? Well, for, first of all, if you are making the comment that I did not see this crisis coming to the extent it came, you're absolutely right, okay? I, I, like many others, underestimated this then, number one. But what I did do uh, very shortly on arriving uh, was begin preparing for a financial crisis. I began meetings with the president's working group on preparations, number one, and number two, uh, I, although I would take exception with a lot of the things you said, I began working on a plan, which we had announced in March, well before I went to Congress, to overhaul this outdated, uh, inadequate uh, regulatory system. And so we, we, we came out with that in March, came out with recommendations that we needed the authorities to wind down these non-banking institutions if they get in trouble so they don't have to be bailed out. The, the only other thing I would say to you was I am not disputing the fact that when Ben Bernanke and I came to Congress, we understood that illiquid assets, because illiquid assets were at the heart of the problem in the financial institutions. That was, a, that was at the heart of the problem. That was a major cause for the losses, for the illiquidity. And so our approach was to buy those illiquid assets. That was our primary approach. And we learned, and as the, as the situation began to crumble all around the world, and it was so clear we had to move quickly, we needed to change gears. And I made the decision that when the facts change, you need to move quickly and change. 
And I'm just saying the only point I was trying to make wasn't to say we didn't come to Congress and ask for illiquid assets, but thank goodness when we came to Congress, we also asked to have some flexibility, and Congress gave us the flexibility. And so, and the last point I would make is the people I care about are the same ones you care about, the, the American people, the people that are going to lose their jobs. And, and the, the tragedy is they didn't create the problem. It are the big banks that created the problem. It's, it's, it's a whole lot of, the problem was created not by them. But they would be the one that would pay the greatest penalty if there was a collapse. But and so th that was what I was working for. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Speer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if, if the people of America didn't create the problem, who created the problem? If, if the people of America didn't create the problem? You said the people of America didn't create the problem. So tell us who created well, it. Well, I, this, this, Were this, the banks involved? Well, I would say this. This was this problem. There's so much blame to go around. You, it, it's hardly. Well, give us a few. It. Give us a few people. Uh, okay. Few institutions. Well, well, you look at excesses had been building up for a very long time. And I just want you to give me some names. I have a limited amount of time. Well, well, would we include okay, the banks? Would we include Goldman? Okay, was, would we include AIG? Okay, would we include anyone who got tarp you could, funds? You could say financial institutions, regulators investors, uh, uh, so th that there was plenty of mistakes by a vast uh, multitude. Of You'd be interested in knowing that in a financial services committee yesterday, all the banks were represented and they, um, almost to the person, indicated that they weren't responsible for this. But let me move on. Um, do you use email? Do I use email? No, I don't use it personally. You don't use it personally or professionally? Yeah, I just don't. So I've, I've never used it for any business communications, just never use it. So while you were Secretary of the Treasury, you never used email? No. How did you communicate with people? Telephone. All right. Um, did you know Mr. Lewis before you were Secretary of the Treasury? Uh, yes. For how long? I, you know, four or five years. Did you know him socially? No. But professionally, you knew him. Professionally, I know him, yes. Okay. Um, when you gave B of A and, and Mr. Lewis $15 billion in October, he didn't want it, we were told. So why did you give it to him? Well, that, that is certainly not my recollection, but let me tell you why we, we gave it to them. Very briefly, because I have a second question I want to ask you. Okay. Then very briefly after we got the TARP authorities and when the system was on the edge and we needed to move quickly, we, deci we decided that the only way to do something that was going to be dramatic and make a difference was going to be to put capital, get capital out quickly and get it out into nine systemically important major institutions. So we called them together, uh, the regulators let them know what the recommendation was for each institution and Mr. Lewis, like the other uh, CEOs there, uh, very willingly agreed to take that capital because they recognized that they had as much to gain as anyone from the stability of the system. All right, so you gave him $15 billion in October and then another $10 billion in January 9th and then $20 billion on January 20th. It's interesting that that amount of money equals about $45 billion. They paid $50 billion for Merrill Lynch. In many respects, I feel like the taxpayers bought Merrill Lynch for the Bank of America. Well, I, I, would, I, I would say this to you. The, the taxpayer is benefited in two ways. Uh, first of all, I would be very optimistic that the taxpayer will get all of that money back with a profit, number one. And secondly, what the taxpayer got was a, an averted calamity because if we'd had the financial system collapse, uh, the, the taxpayer would be the, uh, would, would be the people that would be hurt. All right, let me ask you this. Um, this press release went out from your office as Secretary of the Treasury on January 16th, 
And this press release talks about the package to the B of A and specifically says that the Treasury and the FDIC will provide protection against the possibility of unusually large losses on an asset pool of approximately $118 billion of loans. So this ring fence was a done deal on January 16th. Well, what, what, when what, you were Secretary of the Treasury. We, we worked out the details and, the, and put out a term sheet, but this deal was not closed then. And I left Treasury. Well, how could you possibly say this publicly if it wasn't closed then? Well, because it wasn't we, a deal. We, 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 so we, were you giving him something or giving B of A something that, that they didn't actually have to agree to but give the appearance that they had something and then they could renege on it? Congresswoman, I have no idea what happened after I left. So, but how professional is it to put out a, a statement in a press release that something has been consummated when it hadn't been consummated? Well, uh, listen, we tried to... I mean, that's kind of like I, I'm getting, Contracts 101. No, I, I'm, I'm getting it from both angles here. People wanting me to put out letters when there's nothing to disclose. Here we had... We, what we did is we communicated to the market that we had a term sheet. The market knew that this deal wasn't closed yet. We were announcing a deal with the intent of closing it. And why it didn't close, y you'll have to ask uh, people that are, th that are at, at Treasury today. Mr. Chairman, I, I certainly would hope that we would question further who was responsible at that point in time for these negotiations so we can have them come before this committee. I yield point. back. Good point. Thank you very much. I now yield for five minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Uh, Mr. Paulson, had Mr. Geithner signed off on that memo? The, the terms of the deal? What would you say? In other words, you were just about to transition between Treasury Secretaries. Had, had Mr. Geithner or the incoming administration signed off on the tentative terms? The, Mr. Geithner, as, as you know, was the uh, Treasury Secretary designate. And we wanted there to be a very smooth transition. And so I posted him generally on a number of matters, including that matter. But I never... Uh, viewed him as a decision maker, and uh, I certainly uh, it, it didn't go to him to sign off on the details of, of that term sheet. Uh, I, I have a uh, larger question I want to pursue off, uh, off of Mr. Lewis, but I, ha I want to correct the record on some things that I think have been misstated. Uh, as somebody who voted for all three versions of TARP, uh, took incredible political heat in the middle of a tough targeted race, uh, I believe it was the right thing to do, and I would do it again with some additional caveats. But there's been a lot said today about the restrictions that were put on you. In fact, you came, in my opinion, uh, not very tactfully, and told us that you wanted basically a blank sheet of paper with, with uh, whatever you wanted to do. Uh, initially, they didn't need any Republican votes. Paul Ryan and others in our caucus negotiated some 20 pages of additional things. But the bottom line is that we left there, or the Secretary of Treasury, and those responsible can do whatever they think they need to do. Now, we can try to pass blame. We can try to say whatever we want. And in the future, we probably need to tie it down more. But at the end of the day, our conference, after hours of internal debate, knew that given the nature of the crisis, we had signed a blank check for good or bad that we were going into an election season. We were about to leave town. It was getting highly politicalized. Things were changing. I'm not defending the decisions that you made. I'm just saying it's a, a little bit much for members of Congress to claim that there were all these guidelines in place because we knew full well you had an opt-out clause. Now, that said, clearly you misled us, and we probably wouldn't have had the votes, even though we underneath knew that that was there because we understood it was toxic assets. We didn't believe you were going to take over and, and the way this was going to evolve. Had we known that, the bill would have never passed or would have put tighter restrictions in. Because what I would say is there was a verbal misleading, even though if anybody read the document, it actually gave you a total blank check. Now, I, I would also say I don't understand where people are saying that we weren't in a crisis. Every 48 hours for three months, 
Somebody was calling me, telling me a bank was either calling their revolving loan, the mark-to-market was tightening up their assets, so the banks were having their assets drop, people who were never late in their history, people didn't know how to get their payroll dollars, major corporations in this country were having to borrow overseas from, from third world countries in order to meet their payroll, and there, that I don't know where it would have gone. I represent a district that is the highest unemployment in the United States, that I have either, uh, Elkhart County has been first in unemployment all the way through, but they're 57 percent manufacturing. They're 17.6 percent right now in employment. We were headed to a lot more than we are now. I'm not necessarily happy with everything that's happening, but it could have been a lot worse. I don't know how catastrophic, but in fact it's relatively stabilized and that, that uh, I think there's, uh, that we can have differences of opinion of how to do it. Now here's my concern about what I, I saw in the Lewis thing and where it's evolved. When, when you uh, intimidated, at the very least, Mr. Lewis, into saying the government's going to do it, somewhere in here we went from toxic assets and loans, and your stated goal to us was we didn't want the government micromanaging and directing. That was the next step, the Lewis process. Then you say when you handed it over, you thought you had a process, but then you don't really know what happened after that. Since then, we now have common stock in banks, we're telling them on bonuses. We're micromanaging. Tomorrow, we have a proposal, now that we've taken over stock in GM, to tell GM that they can't close dealerships. Now, this is the problem when government starts to take over. If you were Treasury Secretary now, where would you have started to draw the line here? You started to walk into it with, with Mr. Lewis when you realized that, that could have kind of scrambled. Would you have moved to common stock? Do you believe this has gone too far? What lessons can we learn from what we've seen here? Because right now, the government is in so deep that getting out is going to be very difficult, and we're micromanaging, and Congress is going to start to tell people what kind of tie they can buy if we're not careful. Uh, to, to me, that's the right question. And one of the things that was most difficult for me is I came to the job uh, believing totally, and I still do, in markets and free enterprise and not wanting to see government uh, overly involved. And so I, I, I was forced to make some decisions which were very objectionable, but they were better than the alternative. And I thought, this, I thought the, the decisions we made were going to ultimately help to preserve the markets. So I think the key question is, not only how do you get into these programs, but what's the right exit strategy? What is the right exit strategy? When is the system stable? And when, when, when do we get out? And I don't think that it is appropriate for me, as a former Secretary of Treasury, five months out of the job, to be, and, and not any closer to it than I can am now, to be, to, to, be, to, to be saying more than that, other than because I think everyone here understands that, uh, that government has been forced to do things. I think forced to do things by a, not, not only an a unprecedented crisis, but forced to do things because we didn't have the tools we needed. There were not wind-down authorities. There was nothing to deal with. Uh, a, a the failure of a large non-banking institution other than the bankruptcy process. There was, so, and we had a, a really outmoded, outdated but, regulatory system. It, it, it's, it's fair to say that even under great pressure, you didn't take common stock. Yeah. Yeah, we got a reason. Yeah, I, I did not under let me, um, the gentleman's time has expired, and let me just do a little housekeeping here. We have seven votes on the floor. So the committee will recess un until 1.30. We'll return back at 1.30.